This is part of democracy. Mm. Why do we then say, no, we believe in democracy, we believe in freedom, we believe in these protest rights, but not for you guys, not for the EFF. Mm. In fact, if it's the EFF, we're going to presume that you're going to be violent, you're going to be disruptive, you're going to be a bunch of things. We are living in a post-colonial, post-apartheid South Africa. We have an oligopoly economy, and that if affects the news as well, because yeah. you've got four big banks, four big mines, four big law firms, four, mm. four big everything. <laughs> Spread the fire, welcome back to SMWX. And today I'm really excited to be joined by mighty Jamie, analyst, thinker, someone who studied law, mixed that with an ability to comment incisively on South African politics, and someone who's also been on SMWX once before. Drop a like, drop a clap in the comments for mighty Jamie. Welcome to the show, bro, welcome back to the show. Pleasure to be back, pleasure to be back. Yeah, you are just uh, killing it on Twitter, bro. Like, you are just building your whole new platform. I know you're also on TikTok, building a whole digital platform. But just to say, appreciate the, the work you're doing in building an alternative to the mainstream news narrative in South Africa. Thanks, thanks. And I think it's, it's interesting work, and I think it's important because what we've kind of had now is there's a dominant narrative, yeah. you know, and... There are very few spaces where that dominant narrative is either unpacked further or yeah. you know challenged or we actually try to say is this true part of the mm -hmm. problem i think is that we have an oligopoly economy and that if affects the news as well because yeah. you've got four big banks four big mines four big law firms four mm. four big everything mm. but what that does now is that if you're a media house it means that sometimes you're not able to probe into the spaces where the oligopolies operate yeah. as well as the oligarchs also operate because mm -hmm. we have this this economy is structured in a way and your book actually does touch on a lot of this mm -hmm. right to say listen some of the systemic stuff that we were trying to unravel is still in place yeah and i think if we look at the history of south african media you'll find you know some companies were products of the bruder bond they were products of an apartheid agenda yeah and as we got into post 94 some of those entities remained as commercial entities and dominate a lot of the conversation. So it's difficult Absolutely. sometimes to speak critically and speak mm. truth to power uh, from the mainstream platforms. And I think that's why TikTok and Twitter and a bunch of other places are mm. now playing a bigger role. Yeah. And I think we need those platforms because sometimes, for, for instance, some of the stuff that has been happening you know, with the pala pala. Mm. Those conversations started on social media. True. It was social media that said, come on, man, something's funny about this particular thing. Mm. And the media actually acted like there was no there there. They were like, ah, oh, no, there's nothing to see. Let's keep it moving. Yeah. And then when other shoes started dropping, then the media started coming to say, hey, maybe there's actually something here. But if yeah. you don't have voices um, which are not being curated or policed or even uh, suppressed by editors or whatever other interests exist, yeah. these conversations don't happen. Another conversation was around the State Capture Commission. Mm. A lot of people asked on social media, we are spending all of this money. Is this evidence actually going to be valid? Mm. Are these findings going to lead to particular outcomes? And if you look now, you know, I've seen a few uh, mainstream publications beginning to say, yeah. one billion rand later, where was the value? But if you had actually been looking mm. to say, hey, are there other people saying, hang on, don't get over intoxicated on this particular platform? Yeah. You know, uh, one of the courts threw out the, um, uh, the Gupta, Gupta files as evidence. They look, it's inadmissible. But some of us were actually saying for a very long time that there's a lot of hearsay in the evidence that's being relied upon. Mm. And that's not a defense of President Zuma or anything like that. It's sure. just to say, have we ticked all of the boxes before we commit to this narrative mm. and this body of evidence? And now it's being shown that, hang on, we should have asked a few questions about the, the evidence that was being relied upon. And courts are mandated to follow the rules of evidence. There's a whole you know, doctrine of law 
which looks at what evidence is accepted, what evidence is rejected. But when we were just talking about it in the media space, yeah. sometimes the hearsay was being given the same value as real documentary evidence and mm. real witness testimony. Mm. And now we're beginning to see that there were some gaps. So bro, I, I think just staying on this theme, it's also, it's, it's a difficult journey to try and cut against the mainstream narrative. It's, it's something I've also been trying to, yeah, to do for been. a while. And I think part of the problem is that it requires bravery to say something that's not part of the narrative, but then you also have to be credible. So there are all kinds of people who, sure, cut against the mainstream narrative, but then when you really try to check it out, you're like, ah, but this is just now propaganda. Or yeah. You're clearly in the pocket of some other interest that's not aligned to mainstream interests. Yeah. And in some ways, I think our generation has this task of building an alternative narrative an alternative discourse, which is rooted in the inequalities that we find in South Africa, gender, race, and, and many others, that's cognizant of that, that's representative, that doesn't chronically mm. underrepresent black voices, mm. but that is also well-researched, that is also credible, that is also even better at finding out the truth than the existing platforms. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a real challenge that you've identified. I think what's helped me is that when I was at law school, you know, they yeah. teach you uh, IPAC, Right um, at, at the other universities, they'll add an F to that FIPAC, mm -hmm. which is facts, issues, principles, your analysis, and then your conclusions, or your application, and mm -hmm. then your conclusions. Mm -hmm. And that's what I often try to do. I try to first of all say, what are the facts that are in common, as in they're not in dispute, yeah. and then what are the facts that are in dispute, and then mm -hmm. what are the theoretical frameworks that already exist to understand this particular framework mm -hmm. or this particular problem then what are my lived experiences? And then only at that point do I then try to try to say, okay, here's what I organically and authentically think yeah. about a particular topic. But you can't just rock up to a topic and mm. discuss issues without necessarily having a system. So mine is really to try to make sure that I go through my FIPAC or IPAC, mm. Mm. but also to make sure that I understand the different theoretical frameworks and try to look at interesting case studies and I think having come to the content in that particular way, you, you can guarantee a baseline yeah. of quality. And I think we, need, sure. we do need more of that because yeah. sometimes we have people commenting about stuff that mm. they've not even looked at in terms of like, have you read a few books on this? Yeah. Have you actually tried to get to the bottom of a framework for mm. this? Mm. And then they just speak and it's emotive and yeah. sometimes it's very powerful because emotion in and of itself is great for communications. Mm -hmm. But as you know, there's a fallacy called appeal to emotion. So if all you do is appeal to emotion, you will often find that there's a hollowness in your analysis. And it's a, it's a big challenge, you know? Sure. Because on the one side is all of that um, process and then comes the production and the post-production mm -hmm. and trying to be consistent and regular yeah. whilst you're actually living a normal life or trying to you know make ends meet. And mm -hmm. all of that, I think, um, is a challenge, but I'm seeing now more than ever yeah. that people are beginning to use YouTube. They're beginning to use TikTok. For sure. They're beginning to be on Twitter. There was a bit of a gap between our adoption of, you know, for instance, YouTube mm. as a mainstream medium for content exchange yeah. than the Americans and stuff, you Definitely. know? Even though at universities there was free Wi-Fi, yeah. the content creation side was a bit late. But now we have a lot of content creation and yeah. a lot of appreciation of the platforms and even your platform mm -hmm. is doing phenomenally well now you can get 100,000 views 500,000 views off YouTube yeah. of a discussion of South African content five years ago six years ago that was a very difficult expectation to yeah. have yeah. having said that though there's a bit of an issue on the digital platforms because the Andrew Tate effect has also come into our discourse you know so whilst we're having mm -hmm. some kind of qualitative conversations on those same platforms yeah there are also like some conversations happening there mm. which sometimes i'm like you know what um very dangerous this is dangerous yeah. uh terrain and when it's being absorbed by teenagers without being challenged so it's it's so it's, it would be remiss if we didn't talk about those yeah. sides of the internet but i think if there's no one proactively doing mm. good work on the internet trying to have uh, factual, conceptual, yeah. structured conversations, then there is no thought yeah. leadership on so those true. platforms. So it's a competition, but hopefully we win 
and not necessarily uh, some of the content that's out there. True, because I think the global right, even though it's kind of reeling from its hey heyday in the Trump yeah. era, is definitely interested in South Africa and the digital media space there. I mean, I see, I don't want to mention channels and mm. things, but like fear mongering, people like, you know, just try, trying to stoke as much fear and division as they can with thumbnails and titles. And then you go and you watch the video and it's like, yeah. wow, this is actually really dangerous if it, if it grows uh, a massive audience. Yeah, the, the, I think if I call them the Ben Shapiro disciples, um, they don't have mm. some of the intellectual rigor or pedigree that he has for his right wing content. Sure. But they look at that model and they think that's going to work mm. in the South African context. But our dynamics are different. And some of these anti-woke tirades <laughs> don't land the same way here. Mm. Because while mm. it may be true that America has passed certain milestones, right, the spatial apartheid that continues to exist in South Africa, yeah. the structural issues that we're still doing, dealing with, the Bantu education rebranded that we're still dealing with, those kind of conversations you cannot approach with the American context. Mm. And these guys, I think all they do is see Absolutely. Ben Shapiro and a bunch of other guys, and then mm. they say, okay, this is leading to millions of views Let's for Let's repackage American. it in South Africa. Absolutely. And it doesn't translate. It doesn't work. Yeah. So one, they don't get the same effect. Mm. But two, I don't think that they will actually have the same impact. There's no... Yeah. But anyway, you know, I, I think that they are committed to this. Mm. And there's some political parties which think that this right-wing, Republican, libertarian mm. political approach is the right response to the challenges that South Africa is mm. facing. Mm. But I think it's, it's so dismissive to say to South Africans that move on, right? Yeah. Let, let's just focus on this interpersonal stuff. And let's, while we haven't dealt with the fact that the dynamics in the suburbs of Johannesburg, the suburbs of Durban, the suburbs of the Western Cape are still very much apartheid dynamics. The, the exclusionary costs, you don't have to have the rule anymore, but the price will keep a, a race bar, right? The price will keep certain uh, communities out. And if we are not trying to actually say, what are the pathways to upwards mobility for young people? Yeah. What are the pathways to opportunity? How do we facilitate um, you know, middle in income wealth generation so that those who came out of poor backgrounds can then be able to reinvest that money into their communities, into their families. These are the discussions that everyone is trying to have. Mm. And then this right-wing cabal will just come and say, B is not working, mm. affirmative action is not working. And then they'll use the boogeyman of the government or the ANC and bad application of tenderpreneurship and say, look, you got these five billionaires from the tenders and every black person is still poor. That's proof that we don't need affirmative action. But when we are talking about affirmative action, or some of these affirmative action policies at this level, right? We are saying, let these kids go into university, give them a better funding alternative than the ones that currently exist. Nobody is actually really saying, you know, we just need to take a big share of this particular company and give it to a bunch of black people who don't know what they're doing. Mm. But that's some of the discourse that's happening. And yeah. it's, it's a tricky terrain because if you're not paying attention to the ideological frameworks of some of these people, mm. it sounds, almost persuasive, right? I've heard some podcasters saying, yeah, no, maybe, you know, these guys are right and maybe we just need to give them mm. a chance, etc." cetera. Mm. And you're like, but these guys are also pushing for, you know, segregation mm. in, in the provinces which they run. So when you, when you ask yourself the theoretical framework to say, why does Cape independence seem like an attractive idea? I mm. mean, if we think about it, mm. we are living in a post-colonial, post-apartheid South Africa. And somebody's saying, but wouldn't it be a good idea if we could have a province run based on the very same framework that Cecil John Rhodes saw mm. as a good governance framework? And they say, yeah, but you know, it's just, it's just about governance. Mm. It's just about quality of life. It's just about, it's not really in the context of all of these years. I mean, if you go from 1652 up until 1994, Right? That's a very long period of history. So to be at 30 years later, 29 years later, saying, let's actually do something else, yeah. that doesn't make any sense. And even, even then, the ANC has only governed that area yes. like, for like a few, a few years until it went back into the hands of the DA. Exactly. So I agree. Wow. 
there's a lot that, that I want to add. It's your whole book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> done, done, yeah. So therefore, bye. No, but it's, it's interesting what you say. A lot of what you say fascinates me because I've always thought, and I don't necessarily say it in the book, but one of the things that I'm trying to get at is, let's, let's imagine, right, for a second. I know it's a distant dream. Yeah. Let's imagine we get service delivery right. Let's imagine we fix ESCOM. Let's imagine potholes are filled. Let's imagine that basic services, refuse removal, sanitation, you know, we are now at a world-class level. What country do we still have then? We still have a deeply structurally unequal country that maybe runs faster and more efficiently, but we would still need massive structural interventions to mm. lift those who are bearing the disproportionate brunt of apartheid and its legacies. We would still need massive interventions to remake the inequality of our country. So while, of course, we have to fix ESCOM and we have to fill yeah. potholes, in some ways, the governance crisis that South Africa is facing now has deflected attention away from some of the structural justice questions. Yes. And, and we have to be able to do both at the same time if our generation is actually going to meet the moment. Yeah, and I think what, what is done a lot by the right wing, um, you know, thoughts, uh, leaders, the commentators, yeah. is they take the acute pain mm. and they use it mm. to obfuscate what they genuinely and ideologically believe in. Yeah. Right? If you are libertarian in America, I would be a little bit more flexible to you having that as an ideological viewpoint at this particular point. Sure. But if you're libertarian in South Africa saying, yeah. I don't believe in taxes, I don't believe in this, I don't believe in that, not recognizing that this state is still a developmental state and a state that still needs economic justice and um, a restructuring to correct the design of the economy mm. as mm. per the apartheid agenda. Mm. I think that's that's very critical. And when you look at a country like America, yeah. it's not an example. America is a dystopia right now. The schools in New York are very segregated. The opportunities in New York are very segregated because they didn't modify their structure. And these are some of the fights that they're yeah. still having. The criminal justice system. Criminal justice system. system. It's a lot. So mm. if someone says, yeah, we'll just give you America, mm. where everything works, but everything costs a lot of money, mm. Mm. that's not something that we should embrace ipso facto. Yeah. Because we have to then push back and say, yes, you're giving me one level that I like. I like things to work. I like to switch on lights. Yeah. I like to open a tap. I like to flush a toilet. Mm. I like to connect to the internet. Yeah. All of these things are nice. But if everything is priced at an exorbitant level, mm. that's not going to work. There's a guy called Michael Sandel. He's a mm. uh, professor mm. at Harvard. He yeah. wrote a book yeah. that is called Justice. Yeah. And he's written a few other books. But what he talks about is the over-commodification of the American um, society, mm. where even someone queuing, you have to pay now. And if you ever visit America, I've been there, I think, twice. I was perplexed at the number of things that you now have to pay for. Yeah. And if you don't have access to income, you are immediately excluded from any quality of life that mm. is worth pursuing. Mm. And then now you have to get two jobs, three jobs, just to be able to live in some cities. Some people are making 80,000 US dollars a year and they still can't afford to live in a place mm. like San Francisco. Mm. And if you convert that money, that's about 1.6 million rands. Yeah. So why would we want that? And I think talking about that, it, it brings up the debate about ESCOM. Because mm. you've got one group of people saying, sure. if we privatize, yeah. let's give it to these guys. These guys know what they're doing. Mm. This, this Ikamba consortium knows what it's doing. Mm. Look at the names, you know, Globleg, uh, uh, Mainstream Renewable Energies, you know, African Renewable Energies, BTE Energies. Let's just give it to the private guys. Yeah. They know what they're doing. But private companies run on a profit mandate. So they want to deliver the service to you and they want to add a markup so that they can go and give shareholders return on investment. So if that's what they're doing, at the beginning it's fine because the lights are on. Sure. And then now your electricity bill is 3,000 rands because a large part of the electricity is being provided by private actors. Mm. We don't have to <clears throat> theorize about this. The cost of energy in the United Kingdom is very astronomical as compared to the cost of energy in France, for example, where in France they still have a state-provided uh, public good of electricity, whereas in the UK most of it is coming from France. So the French are making money off the, Europe uh, off the people of the United Kingdom, 
because they own the asset and the other guys don't own the asset. Mm -hmm. So now, when you then look at that ideological framework and say, electricity is a public good. What is a public good? And sometimes you don't break it down to the people. There are certain things that only a state is capacitated to deliver. Because one, if they are delivered by private hands, they are market inefficiencies of various sorts. Either those private actors can deliver the whole thing, but the price becomes exorbitant, or they deliver the thing to the communities that can pay for it. And then you get a lot of people excluded. So when you look at roads, when you look at the army, policing, when you look at uh, a variety of things, justice system. justice system, it's all supposed to be provided for by the state sure. because the state is the only efficient actor which can perform all of those duties and provide for everybody mm. without having missing markets, etc. Mm. So now when people then come and say, actually, the public good of electricity, let's break that up, let's piece it together, let's give some private players, and then they say, but the lights will be on. What they're not looking at is electricity is a natural monopoly. That means over time, eventually one or two guys end up running that whole system. It's a natural monopoly. The way that the provision of electricity to a population of 60 million is structured, you cannot have 50 players there. So it's, there's not going to be competition. It's a natural monopoly. And when you have an oligopoly, or you have two or three players playing there, or one, what eventually happens? Either one, they just jack up the prices because you don't have any other option, or two, they don't care about the kind of service that they deliver to you. If we look at our cellular providers, I don't want to hate on them. You know, hopefully some of them sponsor the, 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 the podcast, right? Um, <laughs> For sure, yeah. So, hey, so hey, it's not a hate we're not, thing. We're not saying don't come and sponsor. Like, exactly. Yeah. Uh, drop me a message down below <laughs> if, if you want to, you know. If you want please to. <laughs> do, please do. Let, let's get the knowledge out. No, absolutely. But if you think about it, mm. everybody mm -hmm. in this room is frustrated so true. with their service provider. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody is frustrated with the cost of mm, data. Mm, Everybody's mm. frustrated with the speed of data, mm. with the reliability of data. But the whole argument was, hey, we can compete and then this will benefit mm. the, the end user. Mm. The reality is I have, I've, I'm yet to find somebody who is genuinely satisfied with their service provider when it comes to, mo to mobile um, internet sure, or sure. data or even the calls. That's an example of what happens in an oligopoly. When you look at the banks, it's a similar criticism. Right? There is a quality of service that you get, but then when you then compare and do a comparative analysis of the markets, which have 20 banks, which have maybe 15 banks, you don't see the same return for the consumer. So we have to really point out those things and say, even if you're being told that, hey, at this level, this is going to help you out, when you break it down and then you say, no, but electricity should never be a private good, then you begin to get it. But if everyone dangles the fact that it won't be stage eight anymore, yeah. it allows them to obfuscate that second layer of debate, which is very important. Because you don't want to have a situation where the lights are on, but everybody in your township cannot afford it. Mm. Absolutely, bro. And I think what, what fascinates me there as well is the debate about privatization and public ownership is often cast as private players being efficient and corruption free. The holy private players. Absolutely. And when we look at ANC governance, and we actually look at examples of privatization under the ANC, what we find is that we have the same corruption problem. Mm. It's just that the corruption goes into the private sector. Yes. So if we take the SAA deal, for example, if we take the Gupta empire, yeah. that was a privatized system yeah. of state corruption. So it's, it's not as simple as just saying, well, we give it to the private sector. Corruption thrives in both public and private places. Now imagine we say, let's privatize everything, but we keep the same system of ANC corruption in place. And then suddenly, all you need to do is be a company associated yeah. with the ANC. Yeah. You haven't solved the problem. All you've done is just maybe make it less public and, and less obvious. So yeah. I think this idea of giving everything over to the private sector fails to appreciate that you're just giving it to the reverse side of the coin yeah. of the corruption problem. And, and what you're describing is dealt with very well in that book, Why Nations Fail, mm. by mm. James mm. Robinson Asimogu, and yeah. Darren Asimoglu. Yeah. And I, I would like to recommend it to everybody to mm. read, mm. take your time through it, because what we're diagnosing here is what is known as an extractive economy, where you have a few elites in the economic sector and the political sector, and the incentives that they have 
are to maximize extraction. But because they are the only ones who can access that extraction, there's no inclusion, there's no competition. Yeah. And then even if you do an intervention, sure. because the politicians are incentivized to also sustain extraction, mm. they then become corrupt. Yeah. So whether you are you know, moving from state-owned to private-owned mm. or back the other way, mm. if the extractive design is, is remains the same, nothing changes. Because oftentimes people will ask, why doesn't the ANC care about education? Why don't these billionaires care about this thing? Th their kids, one, don't go to those schools, but sure. two, it is excellent for the elites to, to structure the economic uh, design of a country on an extractive model when everyone else can compete with them on an even playing ground. So if mm. the elites and the people who benefited from the legacies of apartheid and the politicians who are in charge of the system they inherited, if they were to make the education system so good that brilliant people are qualified and can earn means across the country, they then have too many competitors. They then have too many people who can make money in the market without their influence, without tenders, etc., etc. And if you are in power and you know that the, the design is extractive, you don't want competitors. You don't want an inclusive mm. economy. Mm. So it's important for us, especially as South Africa, because it's one of those countries that is an example in the book. It's, it's, mm. There's a chapter where South Africa is one of the discussion points. Mm. And if we sustain and maintain the extractive design and not move to an inclusive design, whether or not we deal with um, one side or the other side, we're still yeah. going to be exactly where you were describing. And I'd like to recommend to everybody, you know, the Michael Sandel book, Justice, read that book. Yeah. Um, Why Nations Fail, read that mm. book. Those two books will show you, one, the problems with some of the uh, late capitalism thinking that we're seeing in South Africa, yeah. and also the problems that we're also seeing with the idea that privatization is holy. Mm. Because what you've described is that they, this preconception that we have that there is a particular race that can manage things better than another race yeah. or a particular design of an organization that is inherently superior that as soon as you say privatized mm. the SAA planes will fly again and fly on time yeah. that I think is belied by the design of the economy absolutely bro you've you, you've taken us in so many interesting directions and uh, and for the viewers back home we haven't even started on what we wanted to yeah talk about. we're not on the on script <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's also the, the beauty of these kinds of platforms yeah. is you're able to explore things, go in a certain direction and break some of the conventions of yeah. like of mainstream because exactly. we have to there'd be someone talking in your ear you know? saying, Move move on, move exactly, on. Exactly, exactly. Uh, someone would be saying he's mentioned two books, but he didn't actually say you must also buy Caesar's book. Uh, so. but, but I think I think that I mean, goes without saying. So we will also <laughs> link to that. <laughs> that goes you know, um, both your books, I think, are essential reading. Appreciate and that, if people like to jump into the deep end without trying to get a baseline, mm. I think that can be quite difficult. Mm. And I think mm. we have to give you credit because you have tried to crystallize and give a baseline to everybody that is accessible. Because sometimes people don't understand yeah. that a, a PhD scholar can add all manner of words, talk about a, a, a paucity of that, a mm. proclivity to this, mm. a preponderance of that. <laughs> and now everyone is like, Utin mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm. But you exactly. have provided accessible content yeah. that can help anybody, I would even say from like a grade 10 reading level and above, sure. to actually start to think about what are the challenges that South Africa is facing? You, and bro. you can't read the books I recommended from uh, Harvard and all of these other mm. places without reading both books. I appreciate that, bro. Doctor <laughs> Caesar and Bofu Walsh. And it's so hard, and that's that's something that I think you're also doing is is taking deep thought and then translating it in a way that a wider base of people can actually start to interrogate and, and use and Let's do that. Let's do that yeah, now because yeah. we're filming this prior to the national shutdown, so-called mm. national shutdown that's been called by the EFF and various yeah. other organizations. But it's going to come out on the day of that shutdown. So just yeah. so the viewers know that. So we are trying to, in some ways, predict the future. Yeah. And I'd just like to get your, your initial thoughts on this call and the way that it's kind of played out in public discourse so far. Uh, given that people will be watching this as it's actually unfolding. 
And also to say to those watching us, like it's actually hard to predict what's going to happen. Yeah. We don't have a crystal ball, but I think there's a desperate need to analyze this outside of some of the emotion and just outright uh, scaremongering, I think. Emo emotion is fine, emotion is good, but uh, fear stoking is not necessarily. Yeah, uh, so things may have changed by the time you watch this yeah, recording. If the country's up in flames, well. Oh, <laughs> well, yeah. well, then you can measure the quality <laughs> of our analysis <laughs> from the flames. Um, but, but I think the first thing I would say is that it's evident that there's an increase in the agitation on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, we've just gone through student protests. Yeah. We've just gone through healthcare workers protesting. And now we're going into this EFF and affiliates and mm. other political parties mm. protesting um, over on this day, you know, for a national shutdown. Yeah. But if you were to think about January to March, it has not been a quiet period mm. in South African politics. And if I was somebody who was sitting in a position of power, I would definitely uh, be uneasy because I'm seeing a general unease. Mm. And even the media, uh, the media has historically been uh, very favorable to President Ramaphosa. Yeah. They have been very charitable to him and uh, like uh, recalcitrant to critique him. Mm. But this year I've seen more critique and uh, more aggression in the manner in which the media was handling him. Yeah. So I think that there's a real fatigue on the ground and people's problems are beginning to reach up. They've, for yeah. those who are past the boiling point, They'll probably say, no, we haven't reached the boiling point. But mm. a lot of people's problems are reaching a boiling point. Yeah. And many have really crossed that boiling point. If you think about the context of the pandemic and now this post-pandemic period mm. where energy costs have gone up, food costs have gone up, unemployment for young people uh, between the ages of 25 to 34 is at 50%. Yeah. Between the ages of 15, 15 to, to 24 is at 70%. And mm. it hasn't budged. Long-term unemployment has increased from 2012 up until 2022. And when you look at the stats as a data on that, you can see that there's a high level mm. of frustration. So sure. that, that's just an observation. Now, going to the yeah. protests itself, what I've seen, I think, has been some inconsistency and hypocrisy. Mm. From who? There are people who say that, you know, the EFF is not justified to do this, right? But those are some of the same people who were actually participating in the protest and actually participating in a national shutdown, right? So some of the people, like when you hear big business articulating concerns mm. about like vandalism and looting and whatever, in 2017, the economic freedom fighters were part of the national shutdown. So I don't always find those um, criticisms to be justified. Mm. And I think that they don't help us and help the moment, right? Um, Going a little bit further than just some of the, the hypocrisy now, I think there's an interesting question we have to ask ourselves about one, the EFF in and of itself. Mm. So looking at this and at the time of recording, it's pre the protest. Sure. So many um, entities were responding to the EFF one way or another. Yeah. And for me, that shows that the organization is not just a kingmaker or a noisemaker. Oftentimes you hear people say, oh, they just got 10%, so we should just mm. ignore them, we should keep on moving. Mm. But I think that the future of South African politics has EFF in its dynamics one way or another. Mm. I think we cannot undermine or undercut the influence that they possess. And they've shown that in being kingmakers, right, um, in Johannesburg, in Swane. But I think the influence that they have in the discourse and the body politic extends beyond that uh, particular role that they're playing now. Mm. I actually think that regardless of how this plays out, you know, if people are not killed or whatever, um, that they are going to keep growing in size. I actually see EFF hitting 15% in uh, 2024 and maybe even higher. Mm. I'm seeing the Democratic Alliance spiral into irrelevance because mm. I think that they were of the view that if we just get rid of Musi Maimane, we'll get our, uh, you know, old traditional voters back. But I think that was a misunderstanding mm. of the moment. Mm. I think Maimane would have done better if they had actually backed him and what he was trying to accomplish. I think that Absolutely. that right wing element of the party actually held back some mm. of the stuff that he was working on. Just on that, by yeah. the way, I would go so far as to say if that. Coal so if you think about 2016, right? Yeah. DeLille. 
my mane, yeah. my shaba, yeah. were all under that tent. If yes. that tent was contesting for now, this election, yes. they would be in line to potentially govern outright. I think so. And you know what I think also really hurt them in 2019? Mm. There was a lot of Ramaphoria. No, absolutely. And there was nothing any DA leader could do about that. Yeah, right? because he's yeah. he's having his high. Yeah, absolutely. And there are some people Even who are Even DA willing. people were yeah. like, hmm, I might, I might, you know. Uh, the people were willing to, 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 mm. to fall in love with the ANC one mm. more time. Someone joked on social media, no, like some white South Africans were even ready to just give the land back because of Ramaphoria. They were like, it's <laughs> no, it still was... there, maybe, maybe I'll give like 10%. Zapiro know? drew him as Black Panther. <laughs> you know, he was like Rama Panther, <laughs> cutting through the thistles, mm, Wakanda mm, forever. Mm, mm, mm. That's just how romantic the moment was. Yeah, absolutely. I think that now though, mm. there's some soberness. Yeah. One about what are the limits of one man yeah. in a political party, yeah, but yeah. also two, what are the systemic issues mm that have really, even, even if we assume there was no Palapala scandal, yeah, there yeah. were no uh, other issues. Sure. It's very difficult for anybody to turn around an organization yeah. that has kind, the kind of incentives that exist yeah. with the tender system, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. You, you wouldn't be able to change it. And if mm. you did try, they would kill you. So you have to govern within that framework. Yeah. We, we saw Andre De Reuter saying that he pointed out some corruption and he was yeah. told, man, you gotta let these people eat. Mm. You know, Just let them eat a little bit and then see what you can do. Mm. Because if you try to stop the eating, you may not make it out of yeah. this whole situation. Yeah. And, and I think now, if we did have that combo, mm. everyone would be looking at them differently. Because yeah. yeah. they did have a social justice uh, agenda. Yeah. They were multiracial and willing to identify the challenges of identity that exist in yeah. South Africa yeah. and speak openly about them. Mm. And they mm. were speaking beyond some of uh, the liberation political rhetoric, sure, sure. which I think there is some fatigue of, not to say that sure. all of it is no, no longer absolutely. relevant, but I think that people are not always drawn to Marxist, Leninist, Vanonian no, I couldn't agree more. And, and I think maybe sometimes that's where the EFF falls down, is that yes. they're so caught up in that language. Even though, ironically, they're a young party in terms of the age of people, their rhetoric is still quite old. And I don't think they've been able to find a new language to talk about the kinds of inequalities that we see, which is which is partly what I think is called for in this moment, is how mm. do we how do we break free of even the progressive old stuff, Marx and Fanon and all of this stuff. And, and you gotta say the whole thing. You gotta say Marxist, Marxist Leninist, Leninist Fanonian, Sankaris, Sankaris, Sankaris for <laughs> analysis and <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and it's like, what's the new language? Yeah. What's, what's the new thing that we want to do? So, so. Yeah, just to, to also come back to the EFF, because I yeah. know I diverted you onto the DA. Um, with the march, right? Before people accuse us of being... Flippant. I can already see the, yes. the, the, the comments going wild, going wild that this is... We're not, we've been a propaganda channel for the ANC sometimes, different factions, the DA, the EFF, and Action SA. So if nothing else, we're an effective propaganda channel. <laughs> um, but... I think there is, so for me, the problem in South Africa is always the critique is the wrong critique. Mm. You know, it's like we automatically assume that because it's the EFF and because many of their supporters are black, um, that that combination of anger and blackness will lead to violence. Yes. And, and we haven't interrogated that enough on the one hand, but on the other hand, there is something to be said for calling for a protest like this at this moment can go in multiple directions and it could be full, it, it could be lighting fire near gunpowder. Yes. Right? So to what extent do you think the, the EFF is maybe playing a risky game here by igniting something that it might not be able to control? I think this is a very risky move from the EFF because it's not broadly supported. It's um, the ANC is going to push back. Mm. You've seen already other political leaders who participated in 2017 pushing back. So what that means is that they don't have the kind of consensus that, you know, uh, Save South Africa and all of those protests that happened in 2017 have. Mm. What that means is that there's potential for agent provocateurs, mm. there's potential for people to come in under the guise of the EFF protest mm. to cause all men of mayhem. One thing I saw um, in one of the student protests that happened in Bramfontein is that the students went into Bramfontein, yeah. I think it was either 2016 or 2017, I can't remember. Mm. Um, but some of the people who were incinerating the buses, 
yeah. were not students, mm. but they were in the protest. And then they said, fees must fall, protesters ban bus. Yeah. Right? And everyone is like, we, we didn't burn a bus. It was not discussed in the, in the mass meeting. Mm. It was never the agenda. We don't have the equipment yeah. to set a bus on fire. We're students. Mm. We came with backpacks. We have laptops, pens, pencils, mm. erasers, and all, all manner of things. We have maybe uh, some hubbly bubbly equipment, but we don't have yeah. anything that could lead to that. So I think this is a very risky moment because of mm. all of the other stuff we spoke about earlier, that the mood in the country is such a yeah. delicate and fragile move. Um, so it's a high risk game for them. Mm. And to be fair to the critiques of the EFF, sometimes when the EFF does a protest, it does get a little bit rowdy, right? I'm reminded of the cliques protest. Uh, I think it was mm. in Santon. Mm. There was some uh, rowdiness that happened there. I think it was it cliques or H and M. One of those protests, sure. they did go into the shop and things mm. were ransacked, mm. etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But broadly, the issue that they were protesting about, I think, was correct to say mm. you have done this thing which is offensive to black people. We view it to be racist, and we are going to hold you accountable yeah. uh, for that and protest at your at your at your venue. And I think a lot of times things are mischaracterized, right? So if, if all of a sudden, let's say one student is seen bending a pole, it then becomes uh, mm. fees must fall activists are violent, yeah. as opposed to who is the student bending a pole, mm. right? And also even the bending of the pole is now being compared to some extreme act uh, of, of violence, mm. which is not necessarily the case. You know, the, uh, the breaking of those bins and throwing those things onto the street is a major inconvenience and I, I'm sure the costs do accumulate to the municipality. Mm. But that is not the same thing as banning a school. Sure. That is not the same thing as burning a library. So mm. we have a lot of false equivocation and we have a lot of the fallacy of, is it composition, where you take one part of a thing and because you see a feature in that one entity, then you yeah. say the whole organism or being is like that. Mm. So there are some risks here in that respect. Yeah. I do think that the EFF does have that challenge you were talking about that they will they, they, they are influential yeah they are driving a lot of this discourse but how do you move from 15 percent to 50 percent and i think it, it goes to some of the stuff that we're trying to uh point out in the discussion to say as much as we see the hypocrisy the um unjustified uh, presumptions that angry black people will just break things if they get together mm let us also then now say, let's say you do get your 15%. Let's say you even get a coalition agreement that is favorable to you in 2024. Mm. Then what? How do you move from a strong 15% to your own 55, mm. to your own 60? And then how do you execute that agenda with an audience that doesn't necessarily identify as Marxist, Leninist, Fanonian, from a theoretical framework and a framework of living, et cetera. Yeah. And I think that's something that we haven't looked at enough. But on the flip side, I think there's something I want to say just about protests, and maybe we can move on if you want. Mm -hmm. um, but you'll tell me because I'm about to say something explosive. Mm -hmm. I don't think that leaderless movements have worked. And I don't think we've gotten the outcomes from some of these big moments that we were anticipating. Yeah. So when I think about Fees Must Fall, there was a loose structure of leadership sure. and there were some demands that were codified, but there was no structured mm. Mm. leadership. And as a result of that, after one or two years, even the few concessions that the government made in the moment, in the heat of the moment, begin to be eroded. Yeah. And then the only person who has given a structured intervention is the presidency through this uh, FISMAS 4 commission, etc. Yeah. But then they are not really the, going to be the ones who make sure that is executed upon and delivered. And you almost need to have, and I, I'll put it to you, even though they stole some money, a Black Lives Matter type of structure, right? And I'm, I'm not supporting the stealing of the money. But what I'm saying is if you look at Black Lives Matter, because there was an organization yeah. driving it from start to finish, codified with bank accounts, they were able then, in the moments where mm -hmm. you have mm -hmm. uh, a George Floyd, you have uh, someone else being killed by the police, to actually be able to galvanize people and continue the mandate yeah. and be able to push the institutional stuff. Yeah. So in as much as we are talking about protests, right, and not necessarily this, this EFF side of it, is we need to really rethink 
how we think about protests. And I would even give you a second example. The youth of Nigeria had a big moment in SARS. Sure. But it was not structured. Powerful moment. Rihanna was tweeting about massive, it. Massive captured moment. the global imagination. Yeah. Then they get to this election, right? Yeah. And their candidate is blown out of the water, right? Wins in Lagos, but n virtually nowhere else, right? Yeah. Six million votes, respectable. But when there are 87 million registered voters, mm. six million is not going to get you past the established yeah. um, interests in Nigeria. And then we have to then ask ourselves, did we get everything we thought Fismas 4 was going to deliver? Mm. Did we get everything we thought NSARS was going to deliver? And if we didn't get everything we thought those movements were going to deliver, what is the utility and return on democratic investment on protest in and of itself? Mm. And even if the EFF is able to make a point through this protest, right, to say, yeah, you must go mm. and say it as loudly and as effectively and show force, what happens on Wednesday, the, the 20, uh, what is it, 22nd mm. of, of March, when the president goes back to the union buildings and continues with his work, right? How has that moved the needle for the problems that people are facing? So I think it is important yeah. for them to exercise this right to protest and to do so forcefully. And I think it's, it's, it's not necessarily justified for everyone just to say, no, don't do it, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But there is a question, I think, around what is the return on democratic investment? No, absolutely. And I think those of us who, who, who care about the idea of racial justice, who care about the idea of accountability for President Ramaphosa, who care about someone saying something and making some kind of statement about this load shedding crisis, uh, also have to expect that parties like the EFF are doing it in a way that is productive so that the pressure can be brought to mm. bear in the mm. right places. Having said that, though, and I think also in fairness to the EFF, because the dominant media narrative is set, right? Yes. Yeah. EFF, violent, dangerous, this is terrible, it's going to break the country, it's going to descend into chaos, businesses are going to suffer, they're going to break the economy more than the economy is already broken. Mm. I mean, at what point do South Africans stand up and say enough is enough? Like. And, and, and if you don't like the way the EFF is doing it, fine. But we can't continue to be this Goldilocks country where it's, I don't like the load shedding and I, and I don't like what the ANC is doing, but I also don't like what the EFF is doing. They're not doing it in my way, so mm. I'm not going to support that. Mm. But I also don't like the DA because they're doing it wrong. Well, then what are, you, what are you doing, actually? And it's really easy to criticize those who are trying to bring attention to this. Yeah. But... but a part of me is actually happy at least someone is finally standing yeah. up and saying, you know what, we have to do something. Is it the exact tactical way I would do it from my position? No, maybe that's something that's wrong with me. Maybe I'm not seeing something um, because of my comfortable position in society. And I think a lot of comfortable people are worried about this EFF protest. I haven't heard a lot of voices who are uncomfortable, who are unemployed, who are languishing in poverty, where the poverty has deepened in the last few years. So as South Africans, I think we also do need to, to say like, this is inevitable. And either it's gonna happen like this or it might even happen in a worse way. Mm. And isn't the problem actually the government? Isn't the problem actually the load shedding rather than the people protesting about the load shedding and, and yeah. the government? Yeah, I think you, yeah. you've covered a lot of, 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 of sentiments that I think I would share. Yeah. And to, to be fair, Right, insofar as we did see some, uh, you know, what, what shall we call it, um, ransacking, right, at the, was it the, it was either H&M or those clicks, I can't remember which one it was. Yeah, sure. The EFF has run multiple protests. This is not their first protest ever. Yeah. Right, uh, I think in the 10 years of existence, I don't think there's ever been a loss of life. Even in the instances where they were marching to that school, um, we saw yeah. them getting beat up, but we didn't see mm. them returning um, with violence True. to that particular situation. And, and people didn't seem to mind that violence They didn't much. mind when it was the EFF mm. being beat up as well. Th there was some unhealthy glee um, mm. that mm. we saw. And um, when we saw the protesters who were protesting there, what is the name? Is it Brackenfell? Brackenfell, yeah. In Brackenfell, uh, some of the protesters who were supporting the, the, the issue, they actually like had gone into the court 
they had overturned the police car mm. and people were kind of like glossed over some of that stuff uh, yeah. when it was not EFF protesters doing it. But oh yeah, yeah, that was a different one. That, that was, was a different, that, that was, was not wasn't Rackenfold. at the school, that, that yeah, when there was someone shot at the police station, yes, yes. someone, so a private was, citizen went into a police station and shot it up and then, yeah. It yeah. was mayhem, yeah. it was mayhem. Yeah, so sure. I think, yeah, you're right, you're right. I, yeah, I need yeah, to yeah. make that correction. And, and the point I'm making broadly is... Senegal. Yeah, Senegal, they, that's the one, it mm, was Senegal. Mm, mm. So if you look at Senegal, there was a lot, before the EFF yeah. arrived, True. the protest that had happened there yeah. was very violent. And when the EFF arrived, we didn't actually see any violence. Yeah. Then you go to um, Brackenfell, mm. the EFF was a victim of violence and people True. took glee in that. They did that stock, do you remember the stock exchange protest? Which yes. Was like early in the EFF's life. Yes. Tens of thousands of people, peaceful, people even cleaned up afterwards. Yes. Yeah. So, so when we when we take into context all of those things and the fact that they were also part of the 2017 uh, mm. national shutdown mm. and there was no violence, I, I think that that presumption or that narrative does really need to be probed at the question of do we have a sufficient pattern of behavior mm. to presume that every EFF protest is going to meet this criteria? Because if 5% of them um, have ransacking, vandalism, etc., then maybe we have to look at those as being the exception and not the norm, mm. right? And I think this fear mongering doesn't help anybody yeah. and actually just agitates the mood. And actually, on top of the fear mongering, I think I saw some intimidation because when the taxi associations were now saying, you know, such and such and such and such to the EFF, we need to meet with you. I was like, but you guys protest all the time. You pull people out of cars. Mm. People can't go to work. If anybody disrupts the economy mm. when they protest, I think we can all reasonably agree that the taxi industry is number one, if not the sundowns of, of doing that kind of a thing. I'm like, let's, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But I mean, I, I say with all due respect to the taxi industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah if exactly. I ever am in a taxi, <laughs> <laughs> let's not continue this discussion. <laughs> all due respect. But yeah. I think we have to be fair. Obviously, we mm. don't know what's going to happen Definitely. on the day. And at the time of recording yeah. this, protest hasn't happened. Mm. But I think we do have to be uh, charitable to everyone, yeah. including the people that people sometimes are not being charitable to, you know? Mm. And um, it's important, I think, for this protest to happen. Yeah. And it's important for somebody to actually say, there's a critical mass of people who don't like the way the country is going. And the challenge is now, we, we our ideological hats uh, sometimes we don't know how to remove them. It's the Goldilocks thing that you were referring to, and I like the way that you put it. Mm. Because now, if something doesn't fit our exact yeah. uh, preferences and specifications, then we don't want to yeah. entertain it. But like you're saying, some of the criticism is coming from the most affluent parts of South Africa and not from the streets. I mean, so you were speaking about hypocrisy, right? And let's, let's talk about the DA, for example, on mm. this, right? Yeah. They lead a very provocative protest to the ANC's headquarters. Yeah. Right? Like that, I mean, there are many places to protest in South Africa, but going directly to the headquarters of a political party with a lot of people. Yeah. And the DA doesn't, couldn't guarantee what would happen on that day if someone exactly. came and did something crazy. Um, they were outside ministers' residences last week. Yeah. Again, that's people's... That's homes. as provocative like as it that, gets, yeah. They've gone to Nkandla, they remember, mm -hmm. that, or they wanted to try and go to Nkandla at, at, at a time. And then suddenly now this is going to be violent, it's going to be scary, it's going to be... And, and I'm like, which is which here? Are we going to protest to the NC's headquarters and, and stop the nicey nicey approach and say the country is in a crisis? Or are we going to be sit around and have tea and crumpets mm. and hope for President Ramaphosa to come to his senses? Uh, that approach hasn't worked. The the nicey nicey approach hasn't worked. The parliament approach hasn't worked. The let's just be, uh, let's give Ramaphosa space hasn't worked. So, you know, like, what do we do as a country if things are not working? I think that's the question. If you don't like this protest, then what? Th then then what new thing are you going to bring to the table mm. that that actually expresses the dissatisfaction that people are feeling? Yeah, you know, I think... You're right. The Democratic Alliance doesn't have a monopoly on peace or peaceful protest, right? And we have also have to be nuanced because if there's not absolute peace, 
then we also can't say something was non-peaceful yeah. because yeah. The, 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 we, we then become a little bit illogical in trying to say, oh, uh, a window was broken, so it was a violent protest. I think mm. the, there's something that was specifically speaking about yeah. when we speak about a violent protest. And sure. in the South African context, there's a, a wide spectrum of how uh, agitated a protest can be or how rambunctious it can be, mm. etc. And some of those um, events are within the acceptable framework because protest by its nature does come with disruptive elements. Absolutely. Otherwise, it wouldn't be protest. Yeah. Because yeah. if we just say, don't disrupt anybody, mm. don't uh, disturb anybody, yeah. in whatever you do, it must just not get in anybody's way. Mm. It wouldn't be a protest. You might as well people to tell people to stay at home. Yeah. There is a very public and disruptive nature to a protest. Yeah. There's a very uncomfortable uh, nature to a protest. But we also have to ask ourselves this question. When the cyclists cycle on some of these Sundays, everyone has to m take alternative routes mm, till 2 p.m., right? Even, you, you walk, can't. even people walking and going <laughs> you for... You can't. Uh, and the runs as well, the marathons. Hey, entertainment things, concerts. Exactly. Like just having fun. Like, and we accept that. Yeah, yeah. We say this is part of democracy. Mm. It is democratic for us to let the cyclists and the runners have mm. our roads for one day mm. or sometimes three or four days a year, right? Yeah. And we accept that. Sometimes it's the runners, it's the cyclists, sometimes it's the walkers, it's a lot. Sometimes mm. it's about eight weekends sure. that you have to find alternative routes. Mm. Why do we not extend that same logical courtesy to protesters? Mm. Why do we then say, no, we believe in democracy, we believe in freedom, we believe in these protest rights, but not for you guys. Not for the EFF. Mm. In fact, if it's the EFF, we're going to presume that you're going to be violent, you're going to be disruptive, you're going to be a bunch of things. Mm. And I don't think that's necessarily sound. And I don't think it's, it's a good faith democracy. And I would say, as much as these things are uncomfortable, and they are uncomfortable, it's not, it's not great to wake up on a day where there could be a massive protest and so many things could happen. Because we're all crossing our fingers mm. for the best scenario, yeah. where it's a peaceful protest from start to finish and no lives are lost. Nobody wants another shop though. Yeah. But at the same time, as much as it comes with those, discomf those discomforts, we take those discomforts and accept them for yeah. runners, for, for all of these other events. So why not for something which is about contesting the lived realities of everyday South Africans saying, hey, we don't like load shedding, we don't like this, we don't like these particular things. That to me seems objectively more important than me accepting those inconveniences for the cyclists. As much as I value health, mm. I think that democratic integrity matters more to me than the health of cyclists. Absolutely, bro. Well, let's, let's see how things unfold with the national shutdown and we can always come back and, and revisit yeah. it. I think one thing that I wanted to also touch on with you is law and legal analysis. So you're quite unique to the extent that you're an analyst in the public space, but you also studied law, you have your law degree signed, sealed and, and delivered. Um, and that is open space for you to become quite an interesting analyst because you then pick out when people maybe fall foul of the law in their analysis. I remember you did that interesting thing with Daily Maverick where you're like, you brought out a law textbook and you were like, let's yes. look at what criminal law actually means, like what criminal liability actually means in this instance. What's your view of conversations about the intersection of law and politics in South Africa right now from your unique vantage point in both worlds? Because there's also the opposite. There's a bunch of lawyers who don't occupy public mm. spaces who mm. just do what I call law splaining. Yes. Where you just splaining. you just you, you say you don't understand this technicality and therefore you don't understand the problem. So so what's your view of public and legal questions constantly clashing and how that's analyzed in our discourse at the moment? Yeah. So the, I've got two two perspectives. Mm. The first one is that when we do have legal commentary, I often find it uh, you know what, I'm looking for the correct word. I often find it unhelpful mm. to have one legal commentator mm. because sometimes they'll say, this is a very complicated legal issue and then here's our legal expert and then they talk to one person. Yeah. Then I'm like, and oftentimes it's the same person or mm. the same three guys. Mm. Then I'm like, there are so many lawyers in South Africa who are yeah. practicing, 
who argue these issues in courts. Yeah. It's very rare to find 50 lawyers yeah. and 50 people in agreement. Mm. The nature of the field is that people will find nuances, yeah. they'll find caveats, they'll find all kinds of provisions that they think that are important. Even when you read judgments, yeah. often there is a dissenting judgment on a hard case. And that dissenting judgment may often be used in law school for educational purposes because mm -hmm. it may even have compelling arguments that the academic scholars um, prefer. Yeah. Then when you look on the TV, it's just one guy. Mm. Yeah, and here's our legal analyst. Is this yeah. money clean now? Mm. Yeah, yeah, no, the money is clean. Yeah. And then they're like, oh, well, there you have it. The money is clean. Mm. The money is clean. Mm. But if we had two different views, I think that would serve people better yeah, because absolutely. then they get to hear one side mm. of the legal argument and the other side of the legal argument. Yeah. And then that can help them close the gaps. Even mm. if you look at the Palapala Pala scandal, mm. oftentimes you just hear one guy say, oh, no, no, this is fine. Yeah. You know, the president didn't have to declare the money. Mm. Uh, sharp, sharp. Sure. No, Hazim had to declare the money. Yeah. And then if you had someone else in the room, maybe that person can say, well, that's only one of the issues, mm. whether or not the money entered the country legally. There are some other issues about did you have paperwork to trade in foreign currency? Did you deposit the monies within 30 days? Did you actually follow the process for your own um, uh, sofa once you found the money was uh, yeah. taken? Because there's so many elements of law. You know, you've got administrative law, constitutional law, etc. Yeah. And if you were to look at administrative law, there are concepts around abuse of power where there are certain things that you cannot just do. So you can't just say, no, I just told my boy, and he's mm. a policeman, so it's fine, mm. right? Because things have to be done a certain way, otherwise it's considered ultra vires to be unlawful action, yeah. even if you are head of state, et cetera, et cetera. And when you only have one guy coming in without the other view, mm. one, that other person can get comfortable in the fact that no one is going to contradict him, right? If you get a top lawyer who uh, has a particular view on an issue, it's very difficult for a journalist to be able to say, but hang on, according to laws of evidence, according yeah. to this, according... But if you had another lawyer in the room, then you would get that balance. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the American media, or even if you look at the British media or the French media, yeah. they very rarely have one legal expert in a discussion, mm -hmm. unless it is their media in-house expert, because that person doesn't have any other you know, interests outside. Because sometimes a lawyer may think, ah, oh, I'll get business from... Uh, these particular government officials, maybe, you know, my law firm will get to represent these people at another level. Yeah. So you, you remove that. If it's an in-house uh, person, then it may make sense to have one. Sure. But very rarely do we see a situation where you have a balanced panel mm. to give that legal view. So that's the first one. The second one is, I often think that, and I've taken this view and people have disagreed with me, but I, I, I maintain it. Yeah. I think that people who are legal reporters should be lawyers. I think that the instances, or the, the, the complexity and the intricacy of the subject matter requires you to have a theoretical framework to complement that. For instance, if you have not done constitutional law, I don't think that you'll always be always able to make a contribution of high value when you're covering that thing. Sure. But when it gets really technical, like criminal procedure, civil procedure, law of evidence, I think there, that's when you sometimes see mm. the biggest inconsistencies. Mm. Because mm. at some point, someone will say, and this is, I think, what you're talking about, the Daily Maverick example, where people were being accused of having been instigators mm. and having done, et cetera, et cetera, and all they had done was tweet. And when you went and looked at the material of the tweet and what the actual legislation says, you're like, there's no way you can accuse this person of this. Yeah. Uh, some other times, people are saying, well, this is evidence that these people took money from a bank. Mm. They're like, no, it's not actually. This would never make it to a, a, a prosecutor's uh, file. Yeah. And now, you know, like if you look at the VBS scandal, there was a, a lot of EFF are the ones who did this. And then you go uh, two years later and then you say, who was charged? There's no EFF guy who was charged. And maybe there were some irregularities with what Brian Shivambu may have done, mm. but no one was charged. So why for a year and a half did you tell me that EFF are the VBS looters? When I'm looking at the, at, at, at the dock, I don't see an EFFF guy there. And then if you had been looking at the evidence as it was being reported and accumulated, you could have said, but hang on guys, this is not what you are portraying it to be. And if we had that balance in the legal discussion, I think we wouldn't have these kind of issues. But I don't think we're there yet. 
And I do think that part of the challenge that exists is that even though people like the media, oftentimes the income in the media is not the same as you can get in, um, yeah. Yeah. in the big law firms. Sure. And so a lot of people who maybe have interest in this end up in the big law firms mm. and they're not going like, to leave that to, 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 to participate in public discourse. And so someone has yeah. to fill in the gap. But if you look at the standard at New York Times, if you look at the standard at a lot of the publications, and New York Times is often considered to be um, you know, the, the benchmark, they have on their legal uh, reporting side lawyers who also studied journalism. Mm. And some of them actually practiced and lectured. And what you get is a full educational outcome as well as robust journalism. Because sometimes, as you're saying, a lawyer who, who didn't do journalism yeah. doesn't understand the tenets of journalism. Mm. And that's why everything is legalese to him. And now to go to the last part of your question, which is that intersection between law and politics. Yeah. Oftentimes, people forget that lawmakers are lawyers oftentimes, and that there's a relationship between the laws and the lawmakers and the law operators, mm. you know, the executive. And these things interplay which is why you've got fields such as uh, uh, administrative law, constitutional law, et cetera, because there's an interplay between these things. And obviously these things interplay with the justice system in and of itself. And if you forget that those um, intersections exist, mm. sometimes you end up too legalese yeah. or too political. Mm. And there are some areas where you need to have both hats. Yeah. And what I often found that sometimes you have someone who's like so in love with the constitutional court yeah. that all they think about or, or their methodology of thought is constitutional court judgments. Yeah. Hey, what do you think about this? You know, mm. in bear, yeah. this is what <laughs> exactly. uh, judge so and so said. <laughs> yeah. And then if you go to the dissenting yeah. and then you yeah. read paragraph yeah. 17, yeah, yeah. that's what I think. Exactly. And they're like, no, but what do you think? Yeah. Because we're talking about this set of instances. Yeah, yeah. No, let me tell you in Makwanyani, mm, this is what, mm, mm, yes, mm, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we, yeah. we know that's what happened in the court. <laughs> but what is your original thought mm. about this particular situation, mm. which is not exactly the same as that? Yeah. So you have the legalese thinking. Then on the other side, you have the pure, it's all Fanonian. Yeah. It's all Marxist, Leninist. And if we don't have that intersectional, interdisciplinary mm. thought, then we are not able to probe the constitutional questions that exist now. Yeah. And if you look at, for example, the Section 89 Independent Panel Report, you had some people either trying to be too technical. So, no, but if the judge, no, the judge overextended himself. Mm. No, mm. the judge shouldn't have looked at this particular thing because if you think about it from this specific area of law, mm. it's overreach. And then on the other side, obviously, people purely looking at it politically. Yeah. But the question that really needed to be asked, I thought, lied in between. Absolutely. Because there were ethical questions, there were purely legal questions, there were political and questions. there were political yeah. questions. But some people then came making conclusions mm -hmm. about the legal yeah. argument from the political perspective to say, ah, well, it's 12, it's 12 December today. So if we agree that there must be a committee, then this man will not be elected. Yeah. Like, but that's not relevant <laughs> yeah. to the legal question. Mm. The legal question is, is there a prima facie case for him to answer? Yeah. You saying that, no, but it's before conference. So that's why we can't vote a particular way. And then other people, after the vote that was made by parliament, merely judging that on democratic grounds. Mm. Say, well, they voted. So it's done now. So it's yeah. done. Yeah. Without actually going back to say, there's the UDM versus speaker case which spoke about how that vote is supposed to be done. The Constitutional Court has determined that you don't put party over country and that you have an obligation to the Constitution first and that you must vote on your own conscience. Mm -hmm. And even the DA now, with them telling people they must number their votes so that they know, mm -hmm. number 16, how did you vote? That's not what the Constitutional Court said. That's not. They said that you have to vote on your conscience. Meaning you can be a member of the Democratic Alliance and still think, ah, no, I have no confidence in this guy. Sure. And you should not be sanctioned for that, even if you came in the DA bus. They were supposed to do everything that they could to convince you whilst you're on the bus, but if you dissent in the room, it's fine. We see that all across in, 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 in American Congress and British Parliament. But now, if you're analyzing from this side, which is pure politics, ah, we voted. Mm. 
Mm. It's fine. No, they voted. Mm. You know, party line. Yeah. And then you ignore that there's an existing judgment, UDM judgment. And then you ignore the issues that were raised by a very respectable former chief justice. Absolutely. Someone with the highest, this is a guy who won the Olympics of being a lawyer in South Africa. Chief yeah. justice, that's it. Yeah. After that, it's go home. And his name was dragged through the mud because people didn't politically like the outcome they of the report. They even stole his watch to intimidate him. When I saw that his watch mm. was stolen just after that report came out, and I said, a, ah. A story that just disappeared as well. I said, point. who took this man's watch and why? Hmm. I think they were trying to show him you can be touched, hmm. whoever they may be. Yeah. But I mean, if you think about that, this is somebody who has produced work mm. that needs to be treated with respect. By the way, I bought all the Sunday papers Mm. That, that weekend, mm. very few of them actually analyzed the merits yeah. of the argument Absolutely. that was presented. They all Absolutely. closed over and said, no, but people are saying that this thing is because wrong. Because one person said, well, prima facie is not sufficient. And then the chorus just took it up and it became, it became, yeah. But bro, you know what? I think we need a special law and politics. Comment down below for a law and politics chat because I feel like it's a wider, mm. it's a wider chat. It's a wider discussion, yeah. Um, but yeah, bro, um, we're over an hour now. There's load shedding <laughs> and there's a national shutdown happening. Yes. So I think we'll have to leave it, leave it at that for now. Yes. Uh, thank you so much yeah. for having me. I hope no, that people all. found this enjoyable, that they find the book recommendations to be useful. Absolutely. And even Especially the, cases. the new apartheid one. That, yes. That's a great recommendation. That one is, you got to put that on your bookshelf. But bro, I also just want to end off by saying, keep, keep going, keep doing what you're doing. We see it. It's important work. It's... It's not always easy, what with the social media hate that comes whenever you, you know, do something that people recognize, but uh, big ups to all the work that you're doing. Thank you. Aye, aye.